Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of you who are watching this. I will be talking about Hemophilia Guidelines for All, a new ambition of the World Federation of Hemophilia. The World Federation of Hemophilia Guidelines for the Management of Hemophilia is now published and is available for you in this reference. I will be presenting Chapter 6, Prophylaxis in Hemophilia. My name is Manuel Carteo, and I'm a pediatric hematologist at the Hospital for Sick Children in Toronto. Here, I direct the hemophilia clinic, and I am a professor of pediatrics at the University of Toronto. Here are my disclosures. I've worked with many different companies in many different capacities over the years. Here is a list of all the individuals that were part of my team in developing the guidelines on prophylaxis in hemophilia. In addition to me, the others are Dr. Marika Vandenberg, Dr. Emna Guider, Kate Kerr, Manuel Barslag, Lisa Bagley, Francisco de Paula Carreta. Notice that many of these are patients. Then Rolf Young, Margaret Ragney, Elena Santagostino, and finally, Glenn Pierce and Ayla Srivastava. As all of you know, hemophilia is a lifelong severe bleeding disorder. Without regular factor infusions, referred to as prophylaxis, persons with hemophilia, like these two boys, will experience repeated bleeds into soft tissues, muscles, joints, and potentially into their brain. And all of this will lead to destroy joints, pain, disability, and in many cases, early death. But with prophylaxis, boys such as these don't have to experience these things. Prophylaxis with standard half-life factor, which we've had now had for decades, has led to huge reductions in bleeding rates. Shown on this slide are bleeding rates, either joint bleeds or overall bleeds in either children, so pediatric, or in adults and children with severe hemophilia A if treated on demand. In these various studies, well-known studies, including the randomized study by Marilyn Manco Johnson, published in 2007 in the New England Journal of Medicine. And as you can see here, bleeding rates of 11 to 17 bleeds per patient per year. And now in the same studies, bleeding rates of patients treated on prophylaxis with either an intermediate dose prophylaxis regimen or a full dose prophylaxis regimen. And now you can see bleeding rates of one to two to three per, uh, per patient per year. So a huge decrease in bleeding if patients receive standard half-life factor eight on a prophylactic basis. And prophylaxis with standard half-life factor has led to huge improvements in quality of life, allowing persons with hemophilia to participate in work and in sports activities while at the same time protecting their joints. All of these benefits seen in the past from prophylaxis led our World Federation of Hemophilia group to state the following recommendation, that prophylaxis is standard of care, and most importantly, it is standard of care everywhere, not just in my country or in Europe or in Japan, but everywhere in the world. We wrote, and I quote, for patients with severe hemophilia A or B, especially children, the World Federation of Hemophilia recommends regular long-term prophylaxis as the standard of care. When prophylaxis is not feasible, episodic or on-demand therapy is essential treatment for acute hemorrhages, but it will not prevent long-term joint damage. We also made the following remark. In countries with significant health care constraints, the World Federation of Hemophilia still advocates for the use of prophylaxis over episodic or on-demand therapy, but recognizes that less intensive prophylaxis may be used. A second recommendation from our guidelines is the following. The World Federation of Hemophilia recommends early initiation of prophylaxis prior to the onset of joint disease, and ideally before age three. What this all means is that we are recommending primary prophylaxis. Another key recommendation from our, from our group is the following. For patients with 
hemophilia A or B with a severe phenotype, which may include patients with moderate hemophilia, but who bleed a lot, the World Federation of Hemophilia strongly recommends that such patients be on prophylaxis sufficient to prevent bleeds at all times. We don't want patients to have any bleeding whatsoever. So going back to these experiences, which I showed you from one to two decades ago, do these meet the current standards of the World Federation of Hemophilia in 2021 to prevent bleeds at all times? These intermediate dose prophylaxis regimens using standard half-life factor still resulted in bleeds occurring, 2.8 to 2.9 bleeds per patient per year. And these days, I think that most of us will agree that that is still too many bleeds. And as such, those regimens using standard half-life factor are just not good enough. While this regimen, a full dose prophylaxis regimen, is probably okay as it results in 1.2 bleeds per patient per year, but this is what full dose prophylaxis means with a standard half-life factor eight. Shown here is one year of prophylaxis with standard half-life factor eight. Each circle, those little blue circles, represents a needle. That is a lot of needles, especially for children. That would be 182 needles. In young children, sometimes doing even one needle is hard enough. And this is the typical reaction of the children when they have one needle, let alone 182 needles in one year. This is very hard. <clears throat> but the reality is that this is not even real. The reality is that pa patients miss doses. Each X on this slide represents a missed dose. And this is just missing 10% of doses. Most patients actually miss more than that. And every time that a dose is missed, the patient is put at risk of bleeding. So you can see that little uh, space of risk uh, immediately following a missed dose. So clearly patients need products that allow for less infusions so it's that so that prophylaxis is not so hard and so that hopefully they won't miss so many doses and be put at risk of bleeding so many times per year. But let's assume that patients and their families are perfect and are able to do this 182 needles and never miss any doses. What do patients achieve with this with standard half-life factor eight? Basically, with standard half-life factor eight, given every other day. So 182 needles per year, they achieve factor A trough levels of one to 3%. When you plot a one to 3% trough level on this well-known Dutch figure that relates the annual number of joint bleeds on the y-axis versus the baseline factor eight levels in patients with mild or moderate hemophilia, you see that patients with moderate hemophilia with uh, factor eight levels of one to 3%, they still have bleeds. They have two, three, four joint bleeds per year. And so if you let patients with severe hemophilia on prophylaxis go down to such trough levels, it's not a surprise that they would bleed periodically. So patients need higher trough levels than just simply one to 3%. All of this means that patients need more. They need products that can be administered with a lower infusion frequency, meaning they need less infusions. They need products that allow patients to achieve higher factor trough levels. And ideally, they need products that can be administered non-intravenously, or they need a combination of these things, hopefully all of these things. And this brings us to one of the major themes of the 2020 guidelines, a theme that very much distinguishes these guidelines from the previous guidelines, is that we can now do better with prophylaxis than we did in the past. And I would add that we should do better. We write in our guidelines that <clears throat> we can now do better. And we do so by, with this remark by saying that now recognizing that with a 1% trough level, patients remain at risk of bleeding. Most clinicians would prefer to target higher trough levels, no longer 1%, but instead 3%, 5%, or even higher. 
this theme that we can now do better with prophylaxis relates to the use of extended half-life clotting factor concentrates and also to non-factor therapies such as emicizumab, which for the most part are given subcutaneously and obviously emicizumab is given subcutaneously. These treatments allow us to achieve better protection than simply a 1% factor level. The benefits of extended half-life clotting factor concentrates are that they, they allow patients to need less infusions or attain higher factor trough levels, or in some cases, a bit of both, particularly with extended half-life factor nine, but they're still given intravenously. Extended half-life factor eight allows the average patient to switch from an every other day prophylaxis regimen shown here on the left-hand side to a twice a week regimen for most patients with no increase in bleeding. Extended half-life factor nine allows the average patient with severe hemophilia B to switch from a twice a week regimen with standard half-life factor nine to a once a week regimen with extended half-life factor nine. And with this actually achieve less bleeding because of higher trough levels. Emicizumab, which is given subcutaneously can be given weekly and studies show that when given weekly, it results in more than a 90% reduction in bleeds versus if patients were treated on demand. Weekly, of course, is 50 time, 52 injections per year. Emicizumab can also be given every other week, and as such, only 26 injections per year. So the potential benefits of emicizumab relate to less infusions, higher factor trough levels, sort of. They're not factor eight trough levels, but they are protective trough levels. And to the fact that emicizumab does not need to be administered intravenously as it is administered subcutaneously. Emicizumab provides all of these benefits. Based on the increasing availability of emicizumab, we go on to state that prophylaxis is no longer just factor that for patients with severe phenotype hemophilia A without inhibitors, prophylaxis with emicizumab will prevent hemarthrosis and spontaneous and breakthrough bleeding. But we do make the following important remark, which is that long-term data on patient outcomes with such an approach need to be obtained. The fact that prophylaxis is not just factor anymore is forcing us to address and update the definition of what is prophylaxis. The old definition of prophylaxis as indicated in this communication from the SSC of the ISTH in 2014 was the regular intravenous infusion of the missing clotting factor, factor eight in people with hemophilia A and factor nine in people with hemophilia B given in order to increase the factor eight or factor nine level with the intent to prevent bleeding. This definition was clearly a definition based on the intravenous infusion of the missing clotting factor. Now, we define prophylaxis as the regular administration of a hemostatic agent or agents with the goal of preventing bleeding in people with hemophilia while allowing them to lead active lives and achieve quality of life comparable to non-hemophilic individuals. Clearly, this definition attests to the fact that factor that uh, uh, prophylaxis is no longer strictly the intravenous infusion of the missing clotting factor. So the key recommendations to our section, chapter six, are that prophylaxis is standard of care everywhere, that we can now do and we should do better, and that prophylaxis is no longer just factor. So if we follow these recommendations, I think that these boys <clears throat> that are born now with hemophilia can now look forward to a much better life. And with that, I thank you for your attention. And I also thank the Hemophilia Alliance for their support in developing this presentation.